back again. You know what? Let me show you this something. Is, this is on right now, Miss Melody. That's all right. We'll look at it in a few minutes, okay? Oops. <laughs> all good. Yeah, I just got a thing. Okay, good. On my phone. Good. So proud of you. You go, girl. Hey, Barb. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I, I'm so proud of you. I'm working on it. But I just did get back from vacation, right? You're excused. You're excused. My daughter's in there making cookies. Mom made fresh cookies. Have one. There you go. Hey, baby. Good to have everybody. We're going to give a few minutes for people to log on and then we'll get started. So we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 11 tonight if you want to turn to that. Trying to find my stuff here. You notice it's not raining tonight? <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> I I was so tickled. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's not raining. Hope everybody has had a great uh, last few days in the beginning of your <laughs> Thanks, Bubby. You never you recognize them, right? Hi, Jen. Um, hope everybody's been having a great few days um, and uh, that you are ready and eager to get in the Word of God. So, you know, I don't know if you've been to Charleston before. I had never been to Charleston. So when John and I got there, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it was just so quaint. We stayed downtown in the historic district at one of their old, old hotels, you know, like where the floors are kind of like Because <laughs> they suffered downtown, suffered greatly from the hurricane. I can't remember which one that was. Um, Hugo, maybe? But, uh, but anyway, they, it, was, it was so great. And we got a chance to walk to the different things. And we saw the we went to Fort Sumter and saw the Yorktown uh, aircraft carrier. Went, got a chance to go all through it. I, I stood in their chapel and I was like, wow, this is way cool. I could do this, right? You know, this is like really cool. Um, yeah. And, um, and then we went to see one of the plantations. That was Boone Plantation. And then we saw one of the really old old houses um, in the historic district. I like old stuff. Yeah. That's amazing. So I found out that there are two terms that I didn't quite understand. So one is renovated and one is preserved. And so this particular house is preserved. So what that meant was, you know, as the wallpaper is falling down, they let that happen. <laughs> Exactly. Instead of putting it back up. And <laughs> so, needless to say, when we walked in there, it was just like, this is amazing because you could see little pieces of the original decor, right? And that was the goal of this particular house and tour. But you had to have vision to figure out what it would actually look like prior, 
right? You know, because it was it was all about <clears throat> preserving instead of restoring. <laughs> I, I got it. So anyway, let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this evening. And we pray, Father, for us to be here tonight hungry, to be eager to learn from your word. Thank you for this journal from Solomon because we know it reflects your heart and your wisdom. And we just pray for everyone listening, Lord, that they will just uh, press in for a deeper life lessons from it, not just the superficial things, Lord, but the deeper things that you have for us. We are pressing in, and Holy Spirit, you're the one that makes it happen for us. So just grow us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So before I forget, I want to let you know that we were praying for Vicki um, because she had surgery today. And I spoke with her, and she was home. She was kind of miserable, as one could could anticipate, um, but she was extremely uh, happy to be home and grateful, and she goes back to the doctor um, in two weeks to, I think, start rehab and things of that nature. So I'll be checking with her tomorrow to see if we can take some meals and things of that nature, but she, is, she was, um, she was Vicki, okay? She was just Vicki. She was just as sweet as can be, so I'm um, hoping and praying that, um, you know, that she heals very quickly, and we're, we've got her on the prayer team. Okay, so last Wednesday, when we were together, um, we looked at living intentionally for God. We uh, saw that we need to take deliberate action steps to pursue a life with God, the life that he's called us to live. We looked at how the fact that there are risks in life, and we need to step into the water in order to live beyond those risks many times. And we talked a lot about the risks that people seem to be hindered by right now and uh, with regard to um, the pandemic. I understand it, you understand it, but are we gonna stop living? Are we gonna let those risks outweigh our faith? And sometimes we have to make those choices and people don't always like to hear it put that way, but that really is the case. We can't, um, cower in fear and, and, you know, because let's just face it, no one knows, and it isn't evident to me, when this will stop being an active pandemic, right? It just kind of keeps morphing. And so we have to do our part and then we have to say, okay, where is faith? Where is the Lord leading me? I'm not going to shut down and not live because tonight we're going to look at what it means to really live um, in the fullness of, of God and, and talk about getting beyond just living for the moment, but having a heavenly, or let's put it this way, any, a, a, a perspective of eternity. And we're gonna look at the fact that that's really what it means to be fully alive with God, right? We have to be, we live in this world, it has limitations, it has risks, it has dangers, we all know that. Um, we can't control it. We've already looked into that. We know that we can't control those things. But are we going to let life hinder us and stop us from really following if Jesus takes us into different places? And we know that we can't do that. We are called to follow God into the unknown. Just like Abraham had to follow, he had to leave what was comfortable to follow God. We have to do the same thing. And um, so tonight we're going to look at that. There's, uh, we have to get beyond sometimes the uncertainties in life, um, and and we have to put our fears in check because although uh, some fears are good in that they cause us not to take ridiculous risks with our life, etc. Um, when we are so afraid that we can't really live fully alive for God, then we have stepped into something that's really unhealthy. So we have to t we have to take and respond to those things with a greater faith. And so we ask God to increase our faith, right? And we've talked about that in the past too. You know, Jesus, um, you know, and in fact, he talked about the fact that in the Sermon on the Mount, that we have to um, 
you know, get beyond the things that are pressing, the persecution. I'll read it to you. That's just a better way to do it. Here it is. God blesses you when people mock you, um, when you're persecuted, when you're lied about, when you face different kinds of evil. And certainly this pandemic is evil, okay? Um, when you face all kinds of evil um, because you're my followers, be joyful about it. Why would Jesus say that? Be joyful about that. Be, in fact, very glad. He says it because the next sentence explains it. Great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. So that's what it means to really live life in the now, in victory, is because we have a heavenly perspective. We, we have a higher perspective, if you will, of life than just what's going on in a moment. All right? Um, Paul even, think about this, Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to those um, in his spiritual family in the Church of Philippi. So he writes to the Philippians, and he basically says, you know, like, um, you need to rejoice. And they're going through really rough times. They're, you know, I don't know what shut them down, but there were many, many different kinds of persecution going on. Evil was rampant. And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul is in prison, <laughs> and he says, okay, rejoice. I say it again, rejoice, right? And he says, nothing, nothing, no, no day of darkness, if you will, could separate you from God's love. Nothing will ever separate you from God's love. And so we can rejoice because we are loved by God. I have a cute story to tell you. I thought it was so, so fun. So I'm going to read it to you. All right. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go on a camping trip. And after a good dinner, a bottle of wine, they retire for the night. Some hours later, Holmes wakes up. He nudges his faithful friend and he says, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replies, I see millions and millions of stars. And what do you see? And what do you deduce from that? And Watson ponders for a minute. And he says, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Meteorologically, I suspect that we have, we will be having a beautiful day tomorrow. Theologically, I can see that God is all powerful and that we are a small and insignificant part of the universe. But what does it tell you, Holmes? And Holmes says this, Watson, you are an idiot because someone has stolen our tent. You get it? <laughs> so here, and, and think about the name of our lesson, okay? I know this is a little bad, probably a bad telling, but, you know, like one person sits back and all they see is the tent's missing, right? But the other one can see the universe, the beauty of way beyond, all right? As funny as that is, it is real. And people do that, right? Because they're so focused on this one little moment of what's going on. And they magnify it, magnify it, magnify it. And they miss the most beautiful things that God has. I'm going to tell you, people right now are so focused on negative and hatred and confusion and deception. There's so much stuff going on. And they're missing the fact that God has created this beautiful day for us, and he calls us to be fully alive in the midst of it. And we're just worried sick about what is going on right here. And it will rob your joy. So that's something we're going to look at tonight.
You can't let people rob your joy. We can all be tempted to look at life, define it by what's going on in a tangible moment, rather than looking at the fact that life is this complex reality um, of how an eternal God wants to interact with us. He wants to have this relationship with us. And he is not going to fit in our little box of comfort. He's never going to be there. So we have to be willing to look beyond what's going on in a moment to see the bigger picture. We, are, we know that we're going to face some good times. And when we face good times, we have big smiles on our faces and we're happy and life is good and our personality is just like, woo you know like we, I, all is well in the universe because my world is good right you know I'm I'm comfortable with things I'm happy everything's going well but that's not joy you don't need joy for that right when your circumstances are all mountaintop experiences you don't really need joy you've got earthly temporal happiness going on right you're not going to reach down for joy joy is a big deal because joy flows from God. And um, when we face rough times, when we face difficulties, when we are tempted to whine and complain and carry on, be filled with frustration, when we're tempted to be resentful, um, what we basically want to do is kick our joy to the curb because we're miserable. Right? We don't really want to be there when those are the very times that God wants to bring us the joy of our salvation. Remember, Jesus faced the cross for the joy of his salvation. Not that he was looking forward to the cross. He just knew that that was his purpose. If you and I are fulfilling our purpose and we face persecution, we have to sit back and go like Jesus said that would happen, right? He never promised anything other than that, actually. So when we are facing difficulties, that just simply means if we are following Christ, we probably are going to face that, and we have to learn how to find joy in the midst of those things. We have to find it, and it is available to us. So sometimes we, people will wait, and, um, and they will uh, face disappointment, and they'll sit back and they'll go like, okay, I'm going to just wait and sit back until something changes in my life. I'm going, Or, as I said before, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to wait until I'm comfortable with the measure of control going on from the, let's just use an example, the pandemic. And you might just sit in that spot for a very long time and not make any difference in God's kingdom. And I'm going to tell you then who would be wrong. We would. Mm -hmm. We would. That's not what God would want for us. You know, he doesn't have that for us. So um, I know that there are an awful lot of people that are struggling um, with life right now. And, you know, certainly I speak to people um, every day who, who have different things going on. Um, I don't really uh, have anyone that I'm so concerned that they're so depressed that they're not going to be able to handle it. I don't have any of that. But there are people in the world who are like that, right? I was looking up some statistic today, and I thought it was interesting, so I'm going to share it with you. Do you know that more than 37 million Americans take antidepressants? More than 37 million. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just saying that's a lot of people to have to take medication to deal with stuff. Yeah, it's tough. It is so hard for people. Um, you know, even 30, I think it was 3.4%, that's what it was, 3.4% of adolescents take antidepressants. That would be like from 12 to 19 or 12 to 18. I'm just like, God, help us. You know, we, we need joy. We need joy. And we need him to break through in our lives. And I never, I think there are many reasons why we face depression. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance and we really need help. And sometimes it's um, just, you know, people, well, in fact, um, the number one cause 
it says here, the number one cause for depression research suggests this, okay? And there's a few things in a list, but just think about it because as we look at our lesson tonight, we're talking about joy, right? And what it takes and how God really wants to prepare us for it. Um, Long-term unemployment. Living in abusive situations. Long-term isolation. Loneliness. Prolonged work stress, a working environment that is stressful can cause people not to be able to cope or deal with um, the fullness of life. You know, we have in America such a gift in our, we have freedom, right? We can, we can have the freedom to have different opportunities or we can um, head towards our goals. We can uh, fulfill personal pleasure. There's really um, not a whole lot stopping us from doing that. Whether or not it's wise, that's a whole other thing. But, you know, we can do it. We're free to do it, right? Um, we can seek material prosperity, even though Jesus says there's no real joy found in that. But we could do it. We can find it. You know, we can um, find that prosperity. Um, and so with all of the things that people sometimes think is going to make them happy, they find out that it doesn't make them happy, and then they have no place to go, right? What's going to lift their head? You know, it's not a what. It's a who. The Lord is the lifter of our head. He is the, the spirit who who brings us into this alive place and the world needs Jesus and that's just as honest as I know how to be and a lot of times they don't think about their relationship with God in light of that they always there are many people that may believe yes I believe Pastor Mary there's a higher being there's a higher power there's this there's that but the, you you can start there right but eventually, unless you invite that power to live and move and have its being within you, you still are living on your own. For the believer, we don't live on our own. We are never alone. Again, just like the Apostle Paul says, there's nothing that's going to separate you from the love of God. You are beloved of God. He has chosen to love you. He wants you. Um, he makes us feel welcomed. He makes us feel accepted. He makes us feel valuable. He brings life meaning. He calls us into places that are difficult, and he helps us, right? Every That's single day, right? That's how I always say. I always say thank you for always being there for me. Absolutely. I feel it. Thank you. Yes. Always. Now, if you didn't have that assurance of God's presence with you, Julie, you know, like what would be there to lift you, you know? And, and you're isolated and you don't have people around you that love you or care for you and you're lonely. And that happens to so many people. It's a very sad thing. My heart just hurts and aches for people. I'm such a relational person. So because I'm so relational, you know, I just want to always help, right? To lift and to, and to you know, point, point out the fact that, you know, our help comes from the Lord and our love comes from God, and he wants to be in that life union with us, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't have that, it's just going to have to, it's going to be very stressful and very difficult because life, you know, seems to be, I, I look at it this way. Sometimes it feels like our world is getting smaller and tighter, right? It's mm -hmm. just like implode. It's just like, oh, just all kinds of pressures that people face, right? Well, God, he, he sustains us. He controls all of that stuff and he sustains us. So even though there's this pressure going on, we don't have to live under its control. The world is not our master, right? God is. And so we have to live in that place and pay attention to, you know, what is actually going on. And sometimes I feel like people are, they want to, they want to blame the country, they want to blame leadership, they want to blame other people, they, but really, when it comes to finding joy, contentment, meaning, etc., that's a personal responsibility of my own because I live in this free country, right? Mm -hmm. And I may not like what everything's going on, but all of that doesn't have to control me. 
has the mantle. Yes. You understand that. You hope that you do. But you look what's happening to our school system. Yes. Yes. The seeing that constantly. Yes. Yes. A lot of it. A lot of it, Sharon. So Sharon was just mentioning, you know, that the kids in the school systems and the, you know, some of the, um, really, the, I'm going to use it this way. It's called indoctrination in my book, right? Yeah. And so they want to plant these indoctrinating seeds of fear and distrust and all of this stuff. Well, what do we think that's going to do to the little beings of our kids in the future? They're not going to be able to deal with stuff. You, you know, like <laughs> when, I don't know, I can't really speak for anybody else, but my parents were, they were pretty tough. They, they were disciplinarians. My father was truly a taskmaster. You know, like if he said it once, that was enough and you needed to listen. That was just how it was, right? When daddy spoke, everybody stopped and, you know, because nobody wanted dad mad and upset. Not because we were afraid of him. We just knew that it was not going to end well, right? It wasn't like he was going to harm us in any but he was gonna be very unhappy with us and we would face consequences for that disobedience. There was always, and so um, he, he was like that. Then when the issues of life came up, they weren't real quick to like fix that for us. I'm just saying. So for example, um, I remember when I was maybe five or six and I remember lying to somebody that was a you know an adult and my parents made me walk through that whole thing you know like you will call you will tell the truth you will apologize you will not talk that way again this is your day of changing that basically and the next time you are tempted to do such and such you will remember this because this was an easy way out of that. The next time it won't be quite so easy, right? You know, and so, but I, you know, like I just remember, you know, like as a kid, I came up and, and we had to face the difficulties, you know, we, they, it wasn't all fixed for us. It wasn't smooth. And, and, um, you know, I'm not saying that it was a hard life, but it was a different life. I watch kids now and Everything seems to be provided for them, decisions made for them. You know, it's just like, come on, make some choices, make some decisions. Otherwise, you become an adult and you expect everybody else to do something for you, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's an enablement that's really disastrous, right? And when it comes to trying to take away a parent's decision about their children's education, that's stepping way over the line. Mm -hmm way over the line. I'm upset about that. Um, so, um, if we're all living and thinking about this powerful present of God and doing our best to keep ourselves and our bodies um, healthy, um, that's our job. That's our job. That's really, and we ought to be taking care of ourselves with joy too, by the way. And I'm, I have been so convicted over the years and different times when I haven't rested well enough, I haven't done enough to really take care of myself the way I should. And I am trying to do better at that. So I'm not casting any stones, but we all need to really pay attention um, to how we are um, living because stress and emotional disturbances and, and depression and all of that weighs on your physical body too, right? So we need to pay attention to that. All right, so let's look at Ecclesiastes 11. Let's, um, let's start at verse 7. And there's some advice here for the young and for the old. Um, we're going to look at just the first part about the young today. Life is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. <clears throat> so scripture reveals, um, in the Old Testament in particular, scripture reveals light and sunshine, and it represents warmth and security um, in God's love. God's love, in other words, is like um, light and sunshine, all right? And you'll see that throughout scripture when it talks about, 
you know, God's, uh, God's people walked in light. They walked in security. God's people walked in the sunshine. They walked in that, that, that goodness. They understood that, that they were uh, covered by God's love. That sunshine was reflective of being covered by God's love. So in scripture, it says that. So life is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day, right, dawning. Um, when we rest in God's love and protection, we feel, as I said earlier, accepted and valued. We know he wants us to enjoy life. And there are these rewards that God has promised us that are going to come when we need it most and we expect it the least. So uh, God doesn't, ex he, you know, like he wants to bless us, right? And a lot of times when we are, when we are just filled with joy, we don't, we don't have this expectation that we're going to get even more blessings, but a lot of times we do because God's just so happy with how we are enjoying our life and living in that place, right? I can't read what you said there, Peter. When I was about t 10, two of my friends and I decided to break windows in an empty barn near where we lived, and I was the only one. Let's see here, Peter. I got to see more. I hate it when I, where are you, Jen? <laughs> so, Peter, I'm sorry, I couldn't read the rest of it. It's cut it off for me. Um, yeah, you probably had to deal with things, right? I'm going to fill in the blanks there. You probably had to deal, you got, uh, you probably were forced to deal with things differently. Maybe like what I was. I don't know. I'll look forward to your comment in just a little bit. Um, you know, we, we need to pay attention to the fact that, uh, what does God say about a new day? He says, his mercy's new every morning. This is the day that God's created, right? We say that, you know, in our worship time. We do that because it helps our thinking get in line with the fact that God, you know, has created each day as a separate thing for us to enjoy. It's not just that we are to endure something until the next good thing comes along. It's we, he has made this day and there is a way to enjoy it and be glad in it. There is this, this possibility. And um, uh, I am, you know, so aware of that anymore. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you feel this way. Every single day is precious to me. Do you feel that way? I don't really think a lot about tomorrow. In fact, today I was looking at ahead on the calendar and I was thinking about, you know, the holiday time and I was thinking about our market that's going to be coming up and whatever. But I didn't feel any stress over it. I was aware of the planning that we have made, right? Should God tarry or whatever. I've had, I've talked to people this last week who said, oh, you know, I'm really dreading 9-11, this and that. You know, I'm sitting back going like, no, nope. nope, don't have, not even going there, right? Every single day is precious, precious for me. I, I'm loving, I, there aren't very many of you here tonight, and there may be some of you there. I am loving being with you. I'm, I'm determined to be fully present here, to enjoy uh, the, you know, as much as I can, the conversation, the, the thoughts that I love today, right? I'm, I'm determined to find every bit of the joy that I can today. Now, you have to know what a big deal that is, because right now I'm having some work done in the kitchen. My stove is in my living room, yeah, there. When I left, there was concrete dust throughout all of my silverware drawer. Yeah, there's a whole lot. But I am so happy to be here with all of you. It's just not a problem, right? I refuse to get all in a yank and miss my joy. I'm I'm not gonna do it. That will wait. It'll get fixed. It'll get cleaned up. You know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You don't want to know why? Because Jesus promised and said it's going to be okay. And tomorrow, tomorrow's a new day in the love and sunshine of God. And it might even rain, but I'm still going to be in the love and sunshine of God. I'm still going to be in that same place. You know, that's just the way it is. Let's look at verse eight. When people live to be very old, 
Let them rejoice in every day of life, but let them also remember. All right, that word remember is associated with the word know, K-N-O-W, okay? So let them also know, let them also remember, let them know inside that there'll be many dark days. Everything still comes. Still to come is meaningless. So remembrance, it's like a ubiquitous term. It's a flowing term, all right? And it's a theme throughout Scripture. Through, throughout the Bible, God remembers his covenant with his people, and the covenant people are told to remember the promises and the actions of God in their behalf. That is a theme throughout, right? Would you agree with that? Do you, are, have you been, you know, if you've read throughout not only the Old Testament, but the New Testament, it's all about the promises of God, right? His faithfulness. We are to remember he, he has promised, that, that's that word covenant, he has promised to love us, to be faithful. And we have you know, are in that covenant with him, and we're to remember his faithfulness. We are to expound on that. We are to tell other people about how God's actions in our behalf has, has led us to um, a fuller, more meaningful life. That, that right there will help people struggling with depression, right? Won't it? That are depressed because they're lonely or depressed because they're fearful. That will help right there. In the book of Psalms, the word remember occurs 45 times. And sometimes it's um, written by the suffering faithful who cry out to God to remember. they like, hey, God, remember us down here. We're down here. We're struggling with some stuff. Don't forget us, Lord, right? Have you heard the laments? They're, they call them the laments in the Psalms. Um, there's one in Psalm 25, and it reads this way. Remember, O Lord, your compassion, your unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light in the light, and the warmth of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. Right? And then sometimes um, the word remember is used in Psalm 8.4. It's it's by the worshiper who marvels that God has remembered them when they haven't even asked him to remember them or to remember them with goodness and love and kindness. In Psalms 8, 4, it reads, What are mere mortals that you should think of them? Human beings that you should care for them. In other words, God, you know, like I am so, I've heard people say this too. God, you know, doesn't need to worry about me. I'm so insignificant, like a speck in the universe. Why would God bother? You know, because he loves you, that's why. He died for you, that's why. He'd do anything to save you and be with you, that's why. Right? He, you know, but we have to understand that we need to remember just how amazing that God is and, and to proclaim it. We have to proclaim it. All right, let's look at um, verse 9. Young people, let your, and this is a, a um, translation in parentheses for you. So young people, I'm reading from New Living Translation. Let your heart be light. It's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember, here's that word remember again, right? In other words, no that you must give an account to God for everything you do. Think about how, as a young person, I don't know, maybe your parents did this, maybe you had people in your life that, that helped you with this, okay? But my parents used to uh, remind me when I'd head out the door, right, that there was an expectation in them of how I was going to behave while they weren't around, right? And they made that really clear. I didn't have any trouble knowing that when I headed out. I was still Mary Cascarell, and I better behave as Mary Cascarell, right? You know what I mean? It was like, it was crazy. What if our young people now, right, always had that idea that, their lives 
are free for them to live any way they want to, but that in everything that they do, they are going to give an account for their actions to Almighty God, not just their parents, but to God. Do you think things would be any different if people really understood the significance of that word of wisdom? That's basically what Solomon's doing. He's saying, hey, young people, you want to live a certain way, you go ahead. You want to take it all in, go ahead. But remember that you will give an account to God for how you live should you choose to live evil rather than good. Right? Consequences for sure, Miss Sharon. Consequences for sure. You know, we're invited to enjoy life at every single stage. And I know we're talking about young lives. And I, you know, did you happen to see the news where the kids at the um, college auditoriums and they were all excited about their football games going on and there was all this negative press because they were all, they had congregated to enjoy their college, um, you know, the beginning of their college year and their football teams. And it was like, they just, people were unhappy with them. They were, thought they were like irresponsible and going to be super spreaders of this pandemic and I can't say how that's all going to go right I, I don't know I don't know but you can go to Walmart and get COVID right I mean you know like yeah, just by yeah. grabbing the handle of the card yeah. you doesn't have you don't have to be sitting next to the person in the stadium to get COVID mm -hmm. right yeah. so you know like I'm kind of sitting back going like you know uh, kids the wonderful thing about young people is they never really do think anything's gonna happen to them, right? They live kind of like with that in mind. But that's also a hard place, right? Because they don't really think beyond the moment sometimes. Do you agree with that or not? I can't really say how well I thought. I think I, I don't know. I, I, I've always been kind of a, I don't know. How do I wanna say it? maybe a stick in the mud there i go <laughs> i rain on people's parade <laughs> how else could i say it yeah when i was young i'd be like well wait a minute maybe that's not a good idea because what if this and what if that? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was me that was me um uh, you know so like wait don't that's not a good idea i look at things now that i'm not you know in my teens anymore right and I think that was really the wisdom of God helping me right along, but my friends didn't think so. <laughs> they were just like, really? No, you were such a, you were such a Debbie Downer. <laughs> yeah, not, not a 30%. <laughs> oh dear, that any, enough said of that, right? Um, we are to enjoy uh, life and the Lord at every stage that we live every single day and through our many stages of life and I I think actually I enjoy more of my life now than I ever have yeah. and I don't think it's because of my age I think it's because the Lord has opened my eyes to what is really valuable which is people for me you know and so I do I enjoy I, I enjoy really simple things we've talked about that in weeks past about simple pleasures oh that's that's so pastor Mary right <laughs> just love the simple things in life they don't require a lot just love people and love love to uh, be in that place where I'm enjoying uh, the Lord and the Lord in other people that's my happy spot so um, we're free to live how we want to right not just the young people you're free I'm free we're all free to live how we want to but we all have to stand before Almighty God one day and go like okay that was bad I shouldn't have done that right I'm so sorry I you know that's the beauty of repentance and as we go into um, you know our, our Hebrew feast um, you know for this month and talking about things each Sunday, we're gonna see that repentance is a big deal with God. And that's why we need to be in that place where we are putting our hearts out there all the time, right? Not just the young people, leave the young people alone, right? This every single heart 
at every single stage, Lord, examine my heart. We need to be in that place. I get, I get weary sometimes with the fact that, um, you know, people think that they say the sinner's prayer and they're good to go. And that is a beginning. And if you don't go any further with God than that, you have missed everything that he wanted for you. The reason he died was to begin a life of being fully alive with him, right? So, so we need to be in that place. Okay, verse 10. So refuse to worry, turn away from evil, keep your body healthy, but remember, here's that word remember again, know that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. So in other words, you know, you know, sometimes I've heard my kids even say this, you know, it's a shame that when we're young, we have to work, 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 because we really have more energy to enjoy life. It, it's kind of backwards, mom. You know, it's kind of a backwards thing. You know, you like to work. You just want to work all the time. We don't want to work. We ought to be able to play at this end and then work later. I said, it doesn't work that way. But, you know, I, I, honestly, we need to be in this place where we're not worried not stressed right that we have this peace you know like jesus is your prince of peace he's your peace and when we are all worried and upset we're not going to enjoy our life and we do need to stay uh healthy and uh and we all need to be working on that so wisdom reminds us we need to use our freedom for good rather than evil all righty and then let's look at chapter 12 verse 1 and the heading I saw in one of the translations today was the problem of old age <clears throat> verse 1 not that that's any of us all right don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator I'm gonna tell you that that is the temptation that is before every human being throughout their lifetime. Would you agree with that? If I forget that I live before the Creator, I'll do whatever I want and I will find myself terribly lost, terribly off track. I will find myself, you know, where I am today if I hadn't an awareness of the Creator when I was young and brought that awareness along with me, I would be a miserable old person. It's just how it works. We have, we have some. We have some in our, um, in our realms of experience. We know what we're, we've tasted that in people and they've just been they have forgotten their creator, so they don't honor him, and they aren't a part of um, enjoying their life. It's, they can't. They, if you don't think that God created you to enjoy your life and to provide for you and to be in this fellowship with you, then you, you, you only have worldly experiences uh, holding you up. And right now, they're pathetic, aren't they? The worldly experiences that are out there. You can't really travel. You can't really enjoy this. You can't really enjoy that, right? You got to you got to remember that God is he is your creator and he's made uh he makes life pleasant for me. He makes life enjoyable for me. Alrighty, So, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Our joy is directly linked to our measure of obedience to God. Our obedience is how we claim our joy. So if God is joy and he's called me to live a certain way and I need to live in that obedience, when I make the decision that I'm going to live in obedience to what God has told me in his word, he draws me to it and he says, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you uh, to be living and I head that way, I am claiming my joy. It's mine, right? Because it's a connected to obedience. It's connected to honoring God, right? Well, if we say we honor God, it's not about just saying his name in a holy way or our 
or a respectful way. It's doing what he asks us to do, is living how he wants us to live. We can claim our joy then. It's ours. It's our gift, our inheritance. It doesn't, it's not going anywhere. It's ours to have and enjoy. And we need to remember that because it's all connected. So there are several barriers to joy. So let's just look at those real quick. One of the first barriers to joy that I'm aware of are the fact that we tend to make excuses. We tend to make excuses um, that we don't want to follow God until our circumstances change because God, uh, you know, needs to bring something good in order for me to follow. Right? That is an excuse. We people are full of excuses right now, just in general of why they can't do this or that or have this or that or you know why they can't be joyful excuses all kinds of them all kinds of them so that's a barrier to joy we need to get beyond that don't make excuses just get in there and, and trust God and know that he has joyful experiences for you it's it's something he wants to extend and impart to you it's a supernatural thing. It's not just like, oh, I think I'll have joy today. You just, God, just impart to me the joy of my salvation. Impart to me that, which I need. Right? I, it is mine, and you want me to have it, and wisdom says that I can. So um, there are the excuses that I hear sometimes as well. If, you know, so-and-so would change, or such-and-such -such would change, that situation would change, then I would be joyful. I could be joyful if my husband was more thoughtful. I could be joyful if my wife was, you know, less talkative. I could, you know, like, do you know what I'm saying? It's just excuses, like, woo, you know, just all over the place. Your joy isn't contingent on anybody but you. Anybody but you. If you want to get in there and be obedient with God, you can have the joy that he's promised. And it isn't. Uh, based on how somebody else performs near you or in your realm. All right, that's one barrier to joy. The second one is the fact that we tend to be very independent people. And we serve a very big God who wants us to be dependent upon him. Not independent, but dependent. That's something, he, and that basically means to dwell or to rely on God. We, he wants us to be in that place where we're trusting him for everything. Right? That doesn't mean we don't do our part. I'm just saying it's a mindset. It's it's what's going on between our two ears. Remember my my um, devotion. You and I need to pay attention to what's going on between our ears. We need to pay attention to that because God wants us to be dependent upon Him and what He is going to do in our lives. And what happens a lot of times is people say, well, wait, I can handle this or I can handle that. I don't need help with this. I don't need help with that. And none of that is really how God created us to live. He called us to be dependent upon him and to be um, interwoven as his family to take care of one another, right? To love one another, to, to be there for one another. Just as we started our whole lesson today and talking about the fact that uh, Vicki had her surgery, right? Well, if you know, Vicki says, well, I don't need your help. I don't need this. I don't need that. I, none of that. I'm just fine. I can do it myself. She's going to miss out. Now, Vicki's never going to do that because she already knows. She's dependent on God and she loves the, the spiritual family. She knows the spiritual family loves her. She's going to receive. We all have to get to the point where we stop being a barrier to joy because we are so independent that we don't need anybody else, right? You do. You need God and you need other believers. And that's how we were created to live. And if you don't have joy, it may be because you're not welcoming other people into those places to bring you that joy and to stir that within you. Just think about that. There was a um, early theologian uh, by the name of uh, St. Ignatius. And he once said this, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. Have you heard it before? I'll say it again. The glory of God is the human person fully alive. So when we're fully alive, we are 
maybe not even aware of it, but we are agents of change. Did you know that when you are fully alive in God, you are an agent of change, according to scripture? Yeah, you're being renewed and transformed daily, right? And then as you allow that process, you, in, you actually influence other people in change. You bring them toward that change and you become rather, there's a, for lack of a better word, infectious. I'm gonna say contagious. You are contagious. You're much more contagious than that coronavirus. God is power, right? He is power and he wants other people to understand that he wants to bring that power to their lives too. And so St. Ignatius is basically saying, you know, live in that place um, where you are fully alive and you become an agent of change in the world. I want to be an agent of change. Do you? I want, I, I say this uh, frequently, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I want to leave people better than I found them. I want them to, you know, if you spend time with me, I want you to leave and go like, wow, you know, like we laughed so much or, you know, we shared stories and that just inspired me or, you know, Mary did something sweet and it just left me feeling valuable. You know, I want to leave I want to leave people better. What if we lived every single day and we said, "Okay, Lord, whoever my life touches today, let me leave them better than I found them. Let me inspire them with something about you. Let me let you reach through my life in some capacity that lifts them into a place where the world is dark, but you are light." and you are warm, and you are sunshine. Um, you know what I'm saying to you? We need to live with that in mind because that's really what it means. And that's why, you know, we're approaching the end of Solomon's wisdom in his journal, and he's basically summed many things up by saying you need to live fully alive. You need to be in that place. You need to, and God makes you that, in other words, and God makes you fully alive. We live with a sense of purpose. Um, we live, we have this attitude of Christ. That's how we're to live. That's how, what it means to be fully alive. We are relational. We value family. We value friends. We know life comes with a measure of risks, but we don't live afraid, right? That's what it means to be fully alive. We know our identity is found in Christ, and we seek to live according to the truth that he shares to our hearts. He writes it on our hearts. We live being led by the Spirit. You, are you, you realize that when you're fully alive, you are led by the Spirit of God. He just wants to be that light and love through, through your life. We understand work is necessary. So whatever we lay our hand to, whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord. In other words, um, you know, it, years ago, I was a waitress when I was right out of high school. I served tables. I worked in a very, very large restaurant. Um, it had seven dining rooms, and it was huge. And I remember just loving my work. And I just, of course, again, I'm relational. I, I'm a people person. I love to be around people. And so as I was serving, it was so easy for me just to be so joyful because I was, you know, it was just like I was serving the Lord each and every time I was passing a plate and I, I didn't think about it any other way that's just how I saw it and when people would sit and they would eventually they would just start asking for my my tables you know like where but where's Mary working today that's where I want to go right you know because and it wasn't because I was so special it was just that Jesus was so alive right mm -hmm. he was just so alive so um we need to understand that when we're led by the spirit um of God we are not led by our feelings that those are at odds, right? The spirit's at odds with our with our flesh. So we need to understand that that doesn't mean you are led by your feelings. You're led by the spirit, which is truth. We understand about work. And the last thing is joy is, is basically the essence of God. And so it's the essence of real life. And so if you and I are not finding ourselves in that place where we are joyful and filled with this love and this warmth and want, having this desire, being motivated to share that all the time, we really have to take a look and go like, wow, God, you need to examine my heart and help me here because I'm not joyful. And no medication is going to change that, right? 
I need you to show me what I'm missing and what you need to bring to me and how I could grow and develop and, and to be um, more fully alive today than I was yesterday. And then, by the way, Lord, I want to be more fully alive tomorrow than I was today, right? Those, those kinds of desires and to motivate us. And I want to end with uh, Bonhoeffer's quote, which I thought was interesting. Um, and, and many times, St. Ignatius was talking about the fact that we need to start each day knowing that um, we recognize uh, our gratitude to God for creating us and giving us breath and life. And then in the evening, we go to bed and we examine our lives and we go like, okay, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for today. Um, help me to look at all of the things that have been going on today and how did I handle them and how tomorrow would you like for me to do things differently, right? It's an examination of our, um, you know, how we're living our lives. And God wants to look at your, your life. Do you ever think about that as you lay your head on the pillow at night and you just go like, God, you know, um, I really care about what you think about my day. So minister to me today. Bring to my memory, bring to my thoughts times where I was less kind than I should have been or what I could do to really touch or bless another person. I want to do that. Help me to do that better tomorrow, right? Uh, Solomon, you know, wanted that. Bonhoeffer uh, said it this way. We are silent at the beginning of the day. That is that place of gratitude because God should have the first word. And we are silent before going to sleep at night because the last word also belongs to God. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, if we really and truly lived that way and knew that, um, that that's, look, that's living beyond the moment. That's living beyond the moment. That's living with a heavenly perspective saying, God, you know what? You need to speak into my life because you obviously... Um, see all things and you can help me um, translate um, how I should live my life. You can impart wisdom to me and I could live life differently. Like I said earlier, we need to live beyond the moment and we can hold on to our joy a whole lot better if we're not fixated just on all of the negative that's going on um, in a day, but rather looking at the fact that it's a gift. Your each one of your days, how many ever each one of us have, each day is a gift. And it begins with mercy. It should be filled with joy and gratitude. And we should end the day by letting God have the final say over how things were lived out. I hope that um, you and I will think about that as we go in uh, to Yom Kippur and just thinking about... Um, you know, being reflective, it's important to be reflective. It's important to be repentant for the things that we have allowed to take root in our lives that don't belong there. We need to be people who really do appreciate things no matter what our age. Now, tonight we looked at uh, the things about youth, um, and, and that was important to, to talk about. But this is about you and your life before God, and he wants you to be filled with joy every single day. So no one has it better than you. No one has it worse than you. It's just today is your day. This is about you as an individual. He wants you to know that you are priceless. And if you're the only person on earth, he would have died for you. And he wants you to enjoy your days. So promise me that you'll work on that. All right. So let's uh, end in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Solomon's wisdom. We thank you, Father, for um, this section in chapter 11 where it reminds us that we are to know and remember your goodness, your covenant, your kindness. Your, you have created the human family so that you might have relationship with us. And we live as if, uh, you know, we are on our own most of the time. We are not. We have not been orphaned. You have claimed us. You love us. You accept us. You, you value each one of us as unique uh, beings made in your image. So help us to live 
um, fully alive, Lord. Help us to be in that place where we're really paying attention to how present you actually are. I heard a long time ago, Lord, someone in one of my professors say, you need to practice the presence of God. Well, we practice your presence when we live purposefully, intentionally, um, and obediently to your word. So we need to be in that place during this season and we need to pay attention to what it is that you want to bring into our lives. We are not going to live afraid and we are going to live in your faith and in your power. You make all of that available to us. And so we're going to grab a hold of it and we're going to live in joy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, blessings for you. Thanks for joining.